coming in a little closer if you'd like. Out the corner here. Well, good afternoon, folks. My name is William Corthell, and I'm very excited to be up here talking to you folks tonight. Some of you, some of you may know from being at the cemetery tour before, this is the one day of the year where after you all go home, we get to all come up and socialize with one another, and that's pretty exciting itself, but it's even more exciting for me tonight because I finally get to talk to you people and, and uh, actually see people from, from, from this era. Um, I'd expected to be up here before talking to you, frankly. Mr. LaPointe, who somehow makes these decisions about who gets to speak, um, is an educator and a teacher, and, and I was an educator and a teacher. In fact, if I may say so myself, in the 1800s, I was uh, one of the most uh, uh, prominent educators in the state of Maine. I was born in Addison, uh, which is uh, in the other part of the county. My parents had a saltwater farm, and they were seafaring folks and, and fishermen and, and built boats and sailed boats, and, and that's what most of my family did. But when I was a really young boy, I learned to read young, and, and I, I, I couldn't get enough of books. I just loved books. And so when I was 14 years old, my parents decided that they ought to send me to school. And so they sent me off to Washington Academy over in East Machias. Now this is 18, I was born in 1827, so this would be about 18... 45. And uh, um, I started school at Washington Academy in 1845, and uh, I graduated in four years from, from that school. I got a really good education at Washington Academy, but when I got out, I was kind of conflicted as to what I ought to do with my life. I knew that I wanted to be a teacher and an educator, but the problem with that in those days was the teachers weren't very well respected. Most teachers were people like me, a young fellow single who gotten some education, or a, a young woman who was unmarried, and the pay was awful. I mean, you almost had to take a vow of poverty to, to be a teacher back in those years. But I decided that that's what I wanted to do, and I was going to do it even if I starved. So I began teaching around the local schools over Addison Way. And in 1851, I got a job down in Robinson, Maine, as a teacher at the village school. Now, Robinson in those days had four or five little schools uh, in the village, but mine in the town, but mine was right in the village. And because I only made six or seven dollars a week, you had to find a family that would kind of take you in and, and give you room and board for very little money. And it just happened at that time that there was a family, Captain Ebenezer Buck's family. Captain Ebenezer Buck was one of the most famous mariners down east, and he had died recently under very mysterious circumstances. No one could quite understand how it had happened, but whatever happened, his family was left destitute, with their breadwinner dead, and so they took me in for five dollars a week, room and board. And, you know, the other benefit of this was that there was a young woman there, Mary Buck, one of the daughters, who was two years younger than I was. Mm -hmm. She was a beautiful woman, very intelligent, and I fell in love with her. And after a couple of years, I decided, well, I ought to ask Mary if she'd be my wife, and I'm pretty sure she will be. I was a conceited young fellow. So I asked her, and she said no. <laughs> um, she said, William, you can't even support yourself hardly. How are you going to support me and a family? And I do want a family. So I agreed that she was probably right, as she always was. And... Uh, but at that time, in 1851, when I got to Robinson that first year, the Callis Academy down here opened up, 1851. That was a private school also. And the, and the teachers who taught at the Callis Academy, because it was a higher level of education, got decent pay, and, and, some, and they even got some respect as teachers. So I asked, uh, I asked Mary, I said, listen, Mary, if I go away to school and get a decent education so I can teach at a place like Callis Academy, will you wait for me? And she said that she would. So in 1853, I went away to Colby College in Waterford. I got an education in literature and, and uh, languages. And I came back here in 1857. I went up to Cal's Academy to apply for a job. And it just happened. I was a lucky man. The principal had decided to resign. And they hired me right out of Colby College as principal in Cal's Academy. 
Mary agreed to be my wife, and we moved to Calus and, and uh, bought a little home over on Germain Street. Well, things went well. In 1860, I was appointed to be the superintendent of all the schools in Calus. There were 14 schools in Calus in those days, in all the little communities. And things were going very well. My, uh, our daughter, who was here with me, Mary, we named her Mary also, she was born. Um, and things were going quite well. In 1861, however, um, the situation here in the city in St. Croix Valley and in the whole country changed dramatically for everybody. The Civil War began. And um, many of the young men that I had taught the last four years went off to war, and many of the young men who I would have taught went off to war. And it was a terrible, terrible time for, this, for the St. Croix Valley. We lost hundreds of our men who were off to war, and many, many didn't return. Many of the young students I had came, came back severely injured. Uh, it was just a, a sad time. And even while the academy was still, I was teaching at the academy, the academy was still functioning, the, the city's mind was not on education or anything other than the, other than the war. Um, so it was a, a desperate time for us. In 1863, a couple of things happened, though, that, were, that changed things a little bit. I had, my son Willie was born. Um, he was a, a sickly boy, sadly, and he did not survive very long. He died a, a year and a half later. Um, and I was asked by the city government to be the, the municipal judge, which I thought was quite an honor since I'd only lived here six years. I wasn't from here, and they, let me, they asked me to be a municipal judge, which, you know, frankly, wasn't a very uh, taxing job at the time. Most of the young fellows were gone off to war, and they were the ones that were usually getting in the most trouble. Um, and the only crimes that we really had that, that were public drunkenness and swearing and not obeying the Sabbath and those sorts of things, which I'll be honest with you, we didn't even bother to enforce. I mean, this was a this was a seaport community, and if we arrested every sailor who was drunk or swore, it wouldn't. I mean, when the captains went out of out of port with their ship, it would have been accrued just by the captain and the ship's parrot. I mean, it just wouldn't have worked, and sometimes just the ship's parrot, to be honest with you, because the captains ended up in jail too, it would have, if, if I, we'd have been arresting people for being drunk. So there wasn't much to do, until one day, June, no, it was July 28th, 1864, it was the day I, it was a session, it was a set, there wasn't any school in session at the time, the sheriff came to my house early in the morning, he says, Bill, you got to get down to the court courtroom. You got to wait down there because you're going to have a case. I said, well, what, what sort of case are we going to have, sure. He says the Confederates are going to rob the bank. I said, okay. He says, the Confederates? He said, yes. He said, don't even ask me any questions. He says, this is a secret. He says, just go down and wait at the courthouse. Courtroom. So I went down. And I sat there for about four hours, wondering what was really going on. And, and then I hear this terrible commotion out on Main Street. I look out the window, and there is the sheriff and seven or eight fellows that he'd apparently had deputized, and they were dragging three fellows down Main Street, and behind them was a crowd of citizens. And they came clamoring up the stairs, we were on the second floor of the courthouse, and they slammed these three guys down in the seats, and they laid three revolvers and three knives and a Confederate flag on my bench. And the sheriff says, these fellows just tried to rob the Cal's bank. He says, you got to have a hearing and bind them over for trial in Machias. And it was all true. Um, what happened was, and I'll try to make this short because it's quite a story, but uh, the three fellows that, the, that he brought in, one was a guy named William Collins. He was a captain in the uh, Confederate forces, and he was an agent, a secret agent for the Confederates. And the other two were members of the 15th Mississippi Volunteers. And they had gone to St. John and enlisted a bunch of other Confederates who had gone up there and some local sympathizers. And they had, the plan was that these three fellows were going to rob the bank and 15 others we're going to take over the town, put it to the torch, and then raise this Confederate flag up the flagpole. Now, they might well have gotten away with it, except the secret agent wasn't very secret. <laughs> People in St. John soon learned what was going on. In fact, the brother of William Collins went to the U.S. Consul up in St. John and told him what was going to happen in Calais. He uh, wired down to Washington, D.C., wired back to Augusta, who wired back to Calais, and well, three hours before the bank robbery, where these fellows came across the bridge down to Ferry Point, uh, the scheme was known of, and, and uh, by the time Mr. Collins and his two accomplices got to the bank, 
all the bank's employees, the tellers and everyone worked there, they were gone. Everybody in the bank was a deputized man from Cali, some of the hardest men in Cali, and they were all armed. So but by the time Mr. Collins had gotten his pistol halfway out of his out of his jacket, they were, he was looking down the barrel of about seven or eight pistols. And that was the end of the robbery. No one was hurt except one deputy who managed to shoot himself in the foot when he tried to get his shoot. But he wasn't hurt bad, so that wasn't a serious situation. So they had dragged him down and we brought him in. Mr. Collins and, and, the, and the two, these two, uh, these two accomplices admitted that's what they had planned to do. They were quite defiant about it, and they said if the other 15 had showed up, this would have turned out way different. And he probably was right. So I bound them over to Machias, and then the real trouble began, because the citizens had surrounded the courthouse, and they wanted to lynch these fellows. They were serious. They wanted to lynch them. And before you think too badly the, the people of Sidney Callis, you've got to remember we lost a lot of men, a lot of men in the Civil War. And Edmund too, long before that, at the Battle of Fredericksburg, in just one night, we lost five men dead and ten injured. Just one night, and two, and, and including two of the most popular young men in Callis, at the Battle of Fredericksburg. So uh, they really were insistent that we would turn these people over to them. And, but the sheriff and I did our duty, and we got them over to Machias. I was roundly criticized, and so was the sheriff, for not letting the citizens have them. And in fact, in the Eastport Sentinel the next week, they blasted us for not doing it. And, um, it, was, it was a tough time for me for a while, because most people thought that we made the wrong choice of letting them uh, go to, over to jail instead of uh, being hanged right on the spot. Uh, they were eventually convicted sent down to Thomaston. Collins managed to escape in almost no time and ended up back down south fighting for the rebel cause. Uh, so that was my first real serious case. I figured that would be the only case I ever had that was of any interest, but it turns out I was wrong there too because in 1866 the Fenians arrived. If you, many of you know who the Fenians were. The Fenians were Irish revolutionaries. They, they were trying to kick the British out of, uh, out of Ireland uh, and hadn't had much success, so they thought, well, I guess a, a better plan might be to invade Canada from the United States. And uh, that may sound silly, and, and, but I'll, I can tell you, it, it had a chance of success back then. Well, 30% of the soldiers in the Civil War for the Union side were Irishmen. And they'd all been mustered out, they all had weapons, they had a lot of time on their hands, and they all had, they all had military training. And uh, Canada was not very well defended, so there was a possibility this could succeed. So in the, in the spring of 1866, they started arriving here, hundreds of them, hundreds of Fenians. And uh, they initially, uh, most of them, and arrived down in Eastport, because the plan was to invade Campobello, take over Campobello Island, and, and make it a, an, Irish, an, an Irish sovereign country. And then from there, to invade across to the mainland and take New Brunswick. And they showed up here with a whole boatload of weapons and ammunition and, and, and gunpowder. They were well armed, and they looked for a while like the invasion was really going to happen. And at that time, the local citizens of Callis and Eastport and Washington County were pretty sympathetic to the Fenians. You have to remember that the British or the English at that time had supported the Confederates during the war. But we weren't real happy with our neighbors across the, across the way. So uh, it looked like the uh, Fenians were actually going to mount an assault on New Brunswick. And the U.S. government at the, in, in the very beginning decided that, well, we'll just, keep, we'll just let them do what they're going to do. We're not going to interfere. Well, finally, the president of the United States decided that, well, this probably isn't such a good idea after all. And he sent General Meade, who was a hero of the Civil War up here with a couple of armed frigates and some federal troops, and they confiscated this shipload of weapons and ammunition from the Fenians and took every weapon that they could find from them, which pretty much put an end to the Fenian revolution here, or the Fenian invasion of Canada. But it didn't put the end to the Fenians because they we couldn't get rid of them. They kept hanging around. And they caused some trouble here and got me in more trouble too. Now one night they set fires. There was a Fenian in Cal, his name was Denny Doyle. He was the leader of the Callis Fenians. He lived over on Callis Avenue, just uh, across from Academy Street there. He and some of his friends got up and down the river. They built enormous bonfires all the way from Milltown all the way down to the Narrows. And uh, the Canadians, seeing all these bonfires, figured that was the signal for the invasion. They were terrified. 
They came streaming across the border in the hundreds and renting hotel rooms here in Calais and staying with their friends because they didn't want to be over there when the invasion happened. But what happened was the bonfires went out and that was it. No one invaded. <laughs> the only invasion we had from the Fenians was when a couple of these Fenians went across the Ferry Point Bridge and got in a scuffle with a couple of fellows over in St. Stephen. And the St. Stephen boys chased them back across the bridge and on the way back Running across to the United States side, the, the Fenians turned around and took a couple shots at the Canadian fellows. So we had to arrest them. The sheriff dragged him in the next day and set him down courthouse. And he said, uh, "Geez, uh, he says, you know, really, he says they, they, they was more drunk than Fenian." And uh, I said, "Well, okay, we'll find him for being drunk then." So I find him a dollar and we let him go. Well. The telegraph lit up again all the way from Ottawa to Washington to Augusta to Calais that these men had to be rearrested and charged with mayhem and riot and attempted murder and all sorts of things. And so the sheriff went out and he grabbed them and dragged them back into chambers and set them down there. And Denny Doyle and all the Fenians were in court that day. And I said, I got to hold these fellows. And, and Denny says, Well, he says, How about bail, Judge? How about bail? And I said, Well, yeah, I guess we're getting bail. How much? He says, $10 a piece. I said, so Denny and them caught for ten dollars, and they left. And of course, uh, they didn't show up for their trial. Right? <laughs> and we never looked for them either. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, the federal government decided to pay the, the fare for all these Fenians who were hanging around Cowles and Eastport back to New York, which they did, and they all left. But uh, again, I was in trouble. They got mad at me for setting bail on them. So I resigned as the municipal law judge. Went on with my job as uh, as the uh, the principal of the Callis Academy, and I actually went off to the legislature. I was the uh, uh, representative for Callis for two terms, and I was a senator in Augusta for a term. And then in 1876, the governor asked me to be the superintendent of schools in the state of Maine, which would be like the commissioner of education these days. So I left Callis then and moved to Augusta. Um, and he wanted me to be the, the, the commissioner of education because he liked the theories that I had, and my theory was that we had to professionalize teaching. We had to make teachers professional. And I uh, had, had the idea, and as did many at the time, that the, the, the problem was the teachers, the smartest person in the world can be the worst teacher in the world. Unless you know how to impart your knowledge to your student, you're, 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 you're not going to be a good teacher. And teachers didn't really have the, the, the knowledge or the theory of how to do that. And, and so I had uh, suggested that we set up schools throughout the state of Maine just for teachers, and we called them normal schools at the time. Um, and, and we did that. We began setting up schools, and in 1878, this, the, one of the biggest ones was down in Gorham, the Gorham Normal School. And I resigned to go run that school. And uh, I spent the next 25 years of my life in Gorham as the, as the principal and, and head of the Gorham Normal School. Now originally, it wasn't to take teachers who came out of high school and make them teachers. It was, it was for experienced teachers who had had years of experience teaching to go down to the Gorham Normal School and learn how to teach and learn how to, as I say, impart their knowledge to their students. And it was only later that they began to teach high school students um, in, in, in the art of teaching. I stayed down there until uh, 1905 and I came back here and retired. Um, I expected to have a long, happy retirement. I was still in good health, and then one day in 1908, I was getting on my carriage uh, and uh, horse bucked, and I remember being thrown in the air. And I, the next thing I remember, I'm here, at the cemetery, and I, I've been here ever since. I don't know what happened to me. I obviously didn't suffer. I don't remember waking up anywhere. I went from being in the air and to this grave site. Um, so here I am and, and my family is all here with me. Um, you know, it's, it, I've always, I, I've al I always wanted to be buried here in Cowles. Uh, even though I lived more of my life in Gorham than I did here and I did, wasn't even born, I wasn't, didn't come here until I was in my early 20s, Cowles was always my home. I always loved Cowles and we kept the family home. I loved the St. Croix Valley. So uh, this is where I wanted to be buried, although I must say not as soon as it actually happened. But uh, um, I'm happy that I'm all I'm here with my whole family, um, and uh, I know I've been a little long-winded. I apologize. I, I just never have been able to get over that. So, uh, I hope you folks enjoy the rest of your tour, and uh, 
Good evening.